Cool, got that. All right, let me get this one. Bet three, two, one. My ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. 82 points of view with Dorian. I forget what episode it is. I'm tired of keeping track of that. But today, man, I got one of my homeboys from college, man. Um, it's one thing about college, and y'all know how I feel about college. You've been following my content. You've been listening to my content. You know that I'm like, fuck college. But the thing that I do like about college, and I think it will always have this aspect, is the social aspect of it. And because when you're down there and you're in school, especially us, like people that are minorities or first generation, we're down there and we're broke. And so it's kind of like this shared suffering. And so when you see these people or you talk to these people who you who are down there shared suffering with and you see that they're doing great, like you want to give them their their flowers and you want to use your platform to help them as much as possible. So today, man, we got my homeboy, the master investor, Mr. Ian Dunlap. What's up, brother? I appreciate you, man. We came a long way from uh, going to finish line at the mall in Bloomington. Man, man. Try, try to get some threes and some twos real quick and struggling at the counter. I where'd you, uh, you. your uh, freshman year, where'd you, where'd you stay at? Reed. Reed. Okay. I was, yeah, I was uh, tough yep. tough. you were in Reed and I was in yeah. Teeter. Yep. Teeter. Yeah. Yep. 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 Reed had the uh, McDonald's. Man, that was the only thing that was good about Reed. <laughs> uh, rest of us super quiet. And uh, boy, man, Forrest. I wish I was in force. It was, it was, it was, it was just way too many. I, I, I knew like the moment that they showed me that there was a black yeah. floor in a floor, like, yo, I can't, I can't do that. I wouldn't have did good. It was, it was popping up there though. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So the first question that we ask everybody, man, what's the worst job you've ever had? Man, worst and best. Um, working with my dad in seventh grade, my dad has a construction company. Um, so I had to do demo. So I had to go in get the hammer, knock down the walls, help haul it out. Wow. So my dad grew up poor. So went to college, played ball, hurt his knee, came back to the crib. So, you know, all of our parents tell their little war stories. Like, right. Yeah. So he's like, look, and I remember this was, so this is my eighth, you know, going into eighth grade. So I wanted to remember when the pennies for, for those of you that were born after 2000, they call foam, but in 96, they were called pennies. So I wanted them pennies bad. I think there was like 195. It was like 180, the phone pop. Yeah, it was yeah. like, my dad was like, you want some shoes for how much? He was <laughs> like, okay, I'll get them for you. Come work with me four weekends. I'm like, that ain't nothing. You don't do nothing but sit in the truck. Okay, cool. We get, we um, in East Chicago, go to Calumet, and I think it's on Alexander. And he's like, okay, I want you to go in there, help the guys demo, tear the stuff down. I'm like, that ain't nothing. Bro, I get in there. And I'm talking about eight hours of work, 20 minute lunch break. God damn. <laughs> like he was work, like, dim, haul this shit. So in older houses, for those of you who from Indiana, particularly like Northwest Indiana, this is when you still had like metal grates inside of the sheetrock. Yeah. So it was heavy. So I'm doing some Amistad slave labor. And then I did that four weekends. I'm dusty, dirty. And then he like, you still want some pennies? And I'm like, I don't even want them no more. He was like, but I need you to know for everything that you buy, there's a certain amount of time you got to give up yeah. and I need you to see what I'm doing. Don't think this money just coming freely because you see me doing good. You didn't see when I did bad. When I was broke and I had holes in my floorboard, like I sacrificed for you and I never forgot that. So coming from the Northwest Indiana, like I lived in a steel mill city, like that blue collar work ethic has yeah. always been there. So even now, and I'm sure we talk about content, like, a lot of entrepreneurs are lazy because yes. they grew up very privileged, but that was my worst job because of how hard it was, but it gave me an expectation for what hard really is. Like I could be at home doing labor like that now. Shout out to Pops, but there's yeah. no way that was legal. <laughs> bro, I mean, he paid me, but it was gruesome, bro. And then I'm all dirty. I'm trying to eat my lunch. My hands got yeah. dust all. I'm like, oh my God, I can't. Mm -mm. But, but it made me it made me push hard to be like, I can't do any hard labor like this. I can't. That's um kind of similar, man, like not job, but my dad, because it's something about that generation. My dad's mm -hmm. from, from Dayton, Ohio. It's OK, Midwest 60s. They were born like this is some about them 50s and 60s. Like every week I had to cut the grass no matter what, no matter what, unless it was snowing and the snow was on there but yep. leaves no matter how cold it was no matter how hot it was man it wasn't even every week bro it was every five days and 
Like my dad is one of them dudes. Like he got the whole outfit. He cut the grass. He got the weed whacker. He got the 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 thing that kills. The edger, yeah. I mean, he's he's yeah. all in. He takes real pride in his yard, and I just wasn't like that. And I learned at a very early age because I was like probably thirteen. I've been cutting grass for four years by then, and he uh, he was like, "Why do you hate it so much?" I was like, "It just doesn't make any sense. Why don't we just hire somebody?" He said, "That costs money." Yeah. He said, "If you when you get older, you will hire somebody. You better." I said, "I am." He said, "You better like make a lot of money." I said, "I am." And that, as little as that was, man, even when I was at IU and I was wilding on academic probation, and everything, I was still having in the back of my head like, "Nigga, you don't want to cut your own grass, dog." Nope. So, Get your ass in line and do what you're supposed to do. It's yeah, just that's the, the parents in that era is different. And then my granddad been in the military, just that era. But my dad even tells me today, he's like, a lot of people in your generation are soft, and the generation underneath us. So, like in terms of work ethic, that foundation is super important. And we got to remember too, like our grandparents and great grandparents didn't have the luxury of doing what we're doing now. Yep. Like even in some communities, like you couldn't even congregate with other black people and freely talk about ideas so we can't take a lot of this for granted yep yep so you said that your dad hooped or did he play football no he hooped he he did what he hooped he yeah he hooped one year yep where at uh, oklahoma okay oh wow yeah and what year uh, i forgot one year if i tell the wrong year he gonna cuss me out okay okay so yeah, that's he what I and was your dad from east chicago mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah so he hooped. Race. okay so then he hooped and then he and then he came back then he raised y'all in ec Yep. But people that don't really under understand, um, because we talk to them about like they hear St. Louis and they hear East St. Louis, mm -hmm. right? They hear Chicago, they hear East Chicago. Yep. Kind of elaborate on what it was like growing up in East Chicago, Indiana. What East Chicago and Gary was like when I was like a kid is like the south side of Chicago now. It's rough. Like so even like when and I'm sure you went through the same thing. A lot of people who are from Indianapolis can relate to the same thing. Like when I got to college. Being from the harbor side of East Chicago was the first time for like months I didn't hear gunshots. Wow. It was like, so like Baby Park was shooting, like, cause I was two blocks from Guthrie. So anybody from East Chicago, they know what I'm referring to. Like in the 90s, it was wild. Like, so, um, but good people, good middle class area, but it was just, man, it was just a rough area. And then the drugs, like when I was a kid, 91, 92, 93, Gary was a murder capital. Gary's 10 minutes That's away right. from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, you know, people like, oh, you had it lucky. I'm like, I'm, I was lucky to have both parents with the environment. Like it would put a cap on almost what you thought was possible. So then when we finally got to college, it was like, oh, I think it was rough in comparison to how like Bloomington was or the kids who were from Jersey and New York. Um, but being in an environment like that, it teaches you grit, teaches you work ethic. Um, and it's a lot of talented people where I'm from. They just don't get a chance to like make it out and finally get the chance to like shine. One thing that I learned coming from like Indianapolis and my parents, they were from Dayton. So we lived in Dayton before we moved to Indianapolis. Indianapolis, yeah. we were in the middle class and Dayton, we were lower class. Yeah. One thing I learned is like, I know for me, I knew very early that I was going to go to college. It was them saying that, but they put it in my head. And when you're in that environment, even when you're trying to act like everybody else, you will have like an older teenager, like an older person, like, yo, you're not supposed to be here. You're not yeah. going to be doing this. Did you have, did you see that or did you have people do that for you? Hell yeah. And then I had family who was in the streets. So I had family literally being like, if you think you're going to jump out in the streets, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you're not play with. And then people like, I'll hoop. And it was cool because they'd be like, yo, okay, I see you hooping. So shout out to everybody you see. Like when we used to help hoop at KT, they'd be like, yo, just keep going to school. Don't mind the foolishness. Like, because the street stuff isn't anything glamorous, like how everybody hypes it up to be. So seeing it firsthand, seeing friends that, like one of my best friends, like Gary, Gary got shot with 12, 13, like, and then uh, was in a shootout again at 15. Like, it was wild. Damn. Just like, these is like people I'm like, Gary stayed at my mom's house, my grandma's house. I went to his house. This is my friend, friend. You know what I mean? Like, so to see that, there's nothing cool about that. Or to be outside and then they air the park out and you're like, oh my God, please don't get, let me get hit by a stray or anything like that. So yeah, a lot of people in the community, even if they didn't like me or they thought a certain way about me, they would be honest and be like, man, leave that street shit alone. Like, make sure you stay in school and take that path. Take that path, which is different than there now. 
what is it that people wouldn't like about you or that they would 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 say about you? Well, you know, you can be a little bit cocky. When I was young, we all had egos. Yes. <laughs> so me, you, Ty, shout out Chris Rice. Like sometimes, depending on how you grew up, you can rub people the wrong way, and we just didn't know any better. So a lot of it is like, and I talked about this earlier with a few other people, but it's like a worthiness issue. So sometimes we'll talk cocky and abrasive because we didn't have anything or to keep people from fucking with us. Or like you would learn to crack jokes on people in advance so they wouldn't pick on you. But that's all like inner city hood politics that you kind of learn just being in the environment, just trying to make it through. And those things you have to learn to let go of when you're in, in different environments and like, okay, now you can ease up and not be as aggressive or as abrasive. And then also, um, the more cocky you are, and we see it with like Kanye, a lot of it, because Kanye, of course, grew up in Chicago. A lot of it is just like worthiness issues mm -hmm. and wanting to be put on and being looked over by, you know, like Dion being a better producer, Bug being a better producer and not being seen. No one liking him in the rap scene. Like, I grew up in that era when like people was bullying Kanye. So that's what our attitude and aggression comes from. Cause we are, any of us that lived in the Midwest, we know it's not the, always the easiest place to live if you're in the hood. So, but I've, I've learned, I still got a little a couple things to work on. It uh, never leaves that, that yep. never ever leaves. And even like that insecurity, that not being worthy, no matter how much yep. you accomplish, no matter what it is, is always something like, I'm pretty sure you know who, who Robert Smith is. Yep. Um, and there's a quote that, that he said, man, because somebody asked him, like Robert Smith, for those y'all don't know, he's down here in Texas at Austin, Texas. I think his company is Vista Equity Partners. Yep. Um, and he is a billionaire. He's a black self-made billionaire and not from sports to entertainment, which is huge. Rare. Yes. And what he said, he was just like, I still face it. He said, like, I've been to lunch with white dudes who I have more money than and I'll have to pay for the lunch. And they're like, yo, I can't let a black guy buy me lunch still. To this yep. day, you know what I mean. So it's just things that that always is inside of us. And like you said, when you when you come from the Midwest, it gets highlighted. Cause I tell people too, man, like, cause I lived in Texas, I lived in LA, and all that, and it's and it's tough in all these places. Yeah. But that weather, that winter, yo, that shit brings out dogs, and it helps yes. niggas real quick, real yes. fucking quick. Yeah, yep. So cool. So you so you grew up in that in East Chicago. I know one thing that I experienced because when I was in Indianapolis, I went to like a mixed high school. Mm -hmm. um so i had been around white people but when i got to iu indian university different. yeah and i walked to that classroom finite math and it was 200 students and i was Finite the only stuff. black one i was like yeah. what the fuck like how was that for you adjusting from the hoods of east chicago to going to a school of forty thousand students only 1300 black it's different um because i went to a, a private catholic school in high school so it's majority Bishop white no? yeah but you know yeah. um a lot of Latin uh, community was at no dope. But when you go to IU, and it's, I think when we were at IU, it was like, what, 2,000 of us? It was 1,300 because I, I was on union board, and I had to look the steps up for like the step show to see how many of us could actually go. That's crazy. It's, yeah. It was shocking. And then sometimes you would feel it. Like you would feel the tension, the racism, and it wasn't always subtle, especially like the year, like when I first came, that was like when Bob Knight just was like getting removed. So you get to see the disparity in like how loyalist supporters were. In 2001, 9-11 happened. There were some clear divides of racism there mm -hmm. amongst the Pakistani and Arab community. Of So it was like, you get to see it firsthand. So it was intimidating. You learn to adjust. Um, and of course, growing up in the environment, you kind of learn how to like survive and not to be bothered. But I mean, I remember people getting jumped on and shit happening that never got reported and never was in our, our school newspaper yeah um and people being at frat parties and getting jumped and it never got reported yeah. but it was it was a definitely a shocking moment it felt like some higher learning kind of mm -hmm. shit like that for the first two years i was there when when and one thing i think we both can uh, uh test to like when you grow up in those type of environments and then you go to an environment that's so different you start gravitating to what you know so we was hanging out with all black people but at a certain moment, especially for you, like a light had to go off when it came to like, OK, like there's more than one way to make money playing basketball or rapping or even going and getting like a salary job. What was the life for you that was finance and it made you really, really start going in? Just my dad being an entrepreneur. So, I mean, because and this thing about entrepreneurship, it's not always easy. 
So for those of you who are like, I want to be an entrepreneur, man, if you have a good paying job, keep that shit. I'm man. being real with you. The upside is great, but you're going to have three, four, five years when you're going to suffer. Like, even when me and Ty and I, it was like throwing parties. Like, it was dope, but it was like some moments when th- well, we didn't know what was going to work out. Mm-hmm. And then it'd be like, hey, and twin, you know, come on board, right? It's like we were able to get together, like, let's start promoting it. We was just young and fearless. But for me, um, it was seeing the difference in how, like, my dad got treated in certain parts of where we grew up, knowing because some people knew that he had money. And then in the hood, like, you get treated bad if you don't have it. So that was a feeling like, so even like when I was a kid, like, I remember my dad first got a Benz. I remember people like moving out of the lane to let him pass. And I'm like, why are they moving? He like, cause they like the car and don't want to hit it. And I was like, I need some money. Cause when you like, and I, we were like broke, broke at one point, like lights were off barbecue food outside in the winter broke. So like, but that taught me too, man, you have to work every single day. So when people are like, man, you need to get rest. I'm like, I have a son. Like he never had to worry about, is there food? Is there anything? I'm like, man, it's a different kind of grind when you have those experiences. And even how you talked about with Robert, like Will Smith had the same kind of revelation on Oprah back in the day. You guys can YouTube it when he was like, I still wake up and worry about being broke. And Oprah was like, really? And Oprah was like, I don't got your kind of money. But like, but when you go through those pain points, that never leaves you. That never leaves you. Yeah. It always hurts. So my moment of to be an entrepreneur came from my dad. And then luckily I made the right decision to do that. But some of those initial years were tough. Were tough. Damn. That's that's crazy. It's um it's amazing too, man. You had a I won't say that you had an advantage, but you definitely were able I to did. be an, an entrepreneur like in your yeah. household. That's that's such a like me being an entrepreneur and you hit it right on the head. Like you and I both have kids and raising yeah. kids is a very difficult thing. I don't know how you feel, but being an entrepreneur is harder than raising a child to me. Way hard. Ten because times harder. Yeah. Your kid, your your kid grows up and there's love there. And your kid will eventually be self-sufficient and they'll start doing things. Your businessman is like a baby fucking forever. And you can do everything right with your business. And your business can say, Hey man, fuck you today. I'm not yeah. doing yeah. You know what I mean? And then you can ignore your business and your business might come and you might have the biggest days of sales that you've ever had. It's it it's not for the faint of heart. And the fact that you were able to see that with your dad, man, that's, that had to be a huge advantage. And it makes me now, especially like I'll tell my mother all the time, like all the times I didn't take out the trash or wash the dishes, like, I'm sorry. Like <laughs> at this point, it's like shit. Because my brother would be like, you never think mom and dad do anything wrong. I'm like, I get it now. Tr- like, trust me. Um, you want to be on camera again? Yeah. Come on. Come um, on. Come on. Say hi. All right. What's up with right. you? Say hey. Um, but I understand the sacrifice they went through. And then at the time when my dad was an entrepreneur, it was late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. So he was like, even for me, he'll be like, hey, baby, I need you to be quiet. Um, he'll be like, you have the chance to write people directly for business mm. via social media. I had to run Yellow Page ads. That's crazy. Don't tell me that you had a bad day. When you can write people directly and ask them for money, you don't have to leave the house to get money from them. He's like, send them messages and shut up. But coming from that perspective, they were running local TV ads and have to pay 10 grand. And you, you know, when you run ads on TV, you don't know who's watching them and what time you're going to get placed. So I was like, okay, I understand that, get that perspective. So I did have an advantage. Um, but like, as you said, entrepreneurship is not, it's not easy at all. It's not, it's not the dream that everyone makes it to be. And if you guys hear artists like, Russ, who I know you posted recently, Charlemagne, uh, I love Button, Joe Button. The bitterness that you hear is from your business being a baby and many days or many years of not working. Yep. Yep. Baby. That's that's crazy. And even like, I'm glad you framed that, man, because my motto at the top of 2020 was just do shit. And yep. as Xander, Xander, Xander comes in, sorry for the language, but yeah. like, um, they, uh, the ad, like, we get so caught up on should we post this content or will this do well or whoopty 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 whoop but like you just said like your dad was running the business in the 80s and in the 90s and he had to run yellow page ads like i couldn't even imagine putting your ads they were taxing for them ads too and then like think about the politics behind that you know what i mean like are they gonna answer the phone today are they gonna be cool today are they gonna 
process my application like they're supposed to? Do I know this person? Do they got beef with me? Same with like the television ads or with the radio ads. And then you do all of that and people still might not buy. Now we live in this era where we can target people so effectively. Our funnels can be so honed in and yet a lot of people are still apprehensive. It's it's mind boggling. Yeah, it's easier than ever, but it's, it's... Okay, hold on. What I need you to do, baby, is go in the living room, okay? I got you. I love you. This, this is a part of business, though, as a dad. This is what you get to see. My this is a part of it. Right now. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, man, so that's 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 crazy. So you, so your dad's an entrepreneur, and then I remember y'all throwing the parties at IU mm-hmm. and doing that and throwing them in nap. I remember that. So the entrepreneurial spirit was there. What was like the turning point for you where it was like, okay, I'm not about to be like this huge party promoter. Like what was it where it was like, you know what, I'm gonna learn finance and then this is gonna start my career down this path. What was it? I had a marketing agency. Um, I told a story a few times before you guys may have heard it, but I had a marketing agency. I took, so a deposit up front. I was like, I didn't want 10% back of the sales or the back end sales. Of any business that marketed? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so I had a client at the time, great. Everything was going well. Got my deposit. Sales were amazing. Client owed me 80 grand. So you know when you make money. Oh, baby, I need you to live room. Come, don't make me spank you on here, baby. You, come on. Let's not do this. You know I'll get to it. So um, the client owed me 80. So you know when you have a check coming, you spent the money in your head already. Mind you, this yes. is a few months before he's born. And the client says, um, I, she called me and she's like, hey, how are you? I'm like, hey, how are you? Great. I'm good. You need the routing? W- w- what you need? Um, yeah, you did an amazing job, but uh, yeah, I ain't going to pay you. We can go to court. Damn. So come in for where we come from. In the back of my mind, I'm like, no, you're going to pay me my motherfucking money. And yeah. she's like, no, we can go to court. And it probably take a year to get your money. And I'm thinking, like, my cousin will go get the money for two pair of J's and some gas. Yeah. I'm like, what? What? Call my dad. And I'm like, yo, I'm old 80. And she's saying she's not going to get my money. I'm. They're going to go. He said, listen. Remember all them days? You had a homework turned in? And I was screaming at you? And you don't want to take out the trash? You want to talk back to your mama and all that? I had many of them days. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to sit your ass down because your life ain't worth that 80. And he said, I'm going to be real with you. You ain't going to get the 80 no way if you go to court. You may get pennies on a dollar because who knows if she ain't spent all of the 80. So you're going to go to court for what? He said, this is what I need you to do. I need you to go all in. You learn an investing thing. This is the part of business that they don't tell you in business books. Because at the time I was reading 22 immutable laws of marketing and 22 immutable laws of brain. I love Jack Reese and Al Reese and Laura and everybody, right? He said, they don't tell you the horror stories about how clients screw you over. Go all in. Learn how to make money for yourself. Don't be dependent on anybody. And you'll be okay. I didn't want to hear it. But it was one of the best lessons I ever got taught, though. So now, investing... Whether you like me or not, you think I'm too abrasive, I curse too much in my video. Every day, as long as I got connection and I can connect back there, I can make money. I hated it, though. Like, I've had family steal money from me. Like, people get screwed. And you notice all the time, too. You get screwed over in business all the time. All the time. We're seeing it with Spotify when they went public. Like, how many artists do Spotify owe money to, but the execs took it? Yep. Now they did, the, you know, you talked about it. Now it's like you can't even get the show money you was getting for 15 or 20 or 50, but they're getting all of your stream money. So luckily, like, and then, the, of course, the whole Meg situation happened. Okay. But as an entrepreneur and as a man, you have to be able to make money whether your clients are here or not. Because truth is, clients are going to do what's best for them. And remember that quote back in the day when 50 was like, Fans are like fiends. They'll cop from you one day and move on to cop from somebody else. Yeah. Clients and customers are the same way. Absolutely. The same way. So you have to put things in your control and your power. And that's why I start studying 12, 13 hours a day so I can get it and be it. Cause, and then also, like I, I looked at the Forbes 400. There was one person in marketing that was a billionaire, Sir Martin Terrell. 
he's like the Lucian of advertising. Yeah. Yeah. One, you look at financial services and financing, it's like hundreds of people in that Forbes 400. Hundreds, like people you never even heard of that have billions of dollars. Yeah. 500 million, 400 million. It's like, who? I ain't never even heard of this dude. Nowhere. Nowhere. And it's like 480 net worth, 42 years old. I'm like, let me go play over there. Because I don't think I'm talented enough to top all the ad agencies and be like, well, I'm going to get all the clients. Not going to happen. Because you know that most people are lazy. And we'll talk about Gary in a second. But like the competitive advantage that he had is that if you ask the average person on the street who's good at advertising, they couldn't even say Burrell. Yeah. They didn't know. So you're not looking at Ogilvy and Deutsch and Droga 5 and BBD. People don't even know who the fuck BBDO is. So it was a competitive advantage that he had. So that's what made me like, okay, let me lean into investing. And then if I jump into that ocean and put my cup in it, I should be able to pull, pull some coins out of it. What What year was this? It was in 2013 that I went all in. I started in 2010. Okay. So I went all in 20 and I went into a cave. Like Ty I tell you, like, Ty would check on me like every two or three, hey man, you got to check in. I'm like, bro, I am knee deep. Cause you know, when you first start, you're trying to find a blueprint or a system. Yep. So yeah. it's like, okay, I got to figure this out. And then, okay, now Xander's here. So of course it's like, you have to figure, now you putting the plane together while you're in the air and it's falling apart. So the same story you hear from Russ, Drake, early days, 50 pre get rich. You're just in the lab, like working, working, working until you find your blueprint. And now people are now like, oh, Ian, I'm so proud of you. But it's like, I remember when people thought I was crazy for wanting to be an entrepreneur. Even at IU, I've been in the library with the marketing. Books. What the fuck are you doing? You ain't, you ain't even in the B school. Yes. Yes. It's like, bro. It's, and then recession happens, world change. Because I remember when, we, when it was like, go to school, you get a job guarantee, 80% placement. Recession happened. Game over. World change. Here we are again. World change. Corona is going to make the environment different because everybody is getting conditioned to work from home. If you start to work from home, those benefits and pay are going to get cut dramatically. Guess what? More gig economy. Now you have to learn how to make money for yourself. It's going to be different. It's going to be way different. We're going we're gonna to jump ahead with that. What do you think? What's your prediction? Because we're going through the corona right now. So when this airs, when everybody sees it, like we're going through the coronavirus, the country pretty much is on lockdown. It's on shutdown. Yeah. Everybody's working from home. When they free everything back up, like you just said, like what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to give some reference points for the audience. So we had a recession. You graduated. You came out of IU at- oh, five. Okay, 05. I yeah. came out in 2007, really 2008, but it was 2007. Yeah. But like recession happened. Mm -hmm. After the recession, right? We saw Uber. We saw Airbnb, right? Yep. We saw Facebook really double down on ads. We yes. saw influencers. We saw the rise of all these things. I think Corona is going to have the same effect, but I want to hear your opinion. What do you think is going to happen after we come back to that's going to get, what markets are going to get crushed? And then where do people need to be looking at right now for the future? Um, for the future, you have to look towards content, the thing that you're doing now. You're going to have to triple down on content because even to get a job, you're going to have to be known. First and foremost. Second, so I'm investing, right? Uh, you have to learn how to invest on your own. And this isn't a segue or pitch for me because I don't need anyone to do business with me. But I'm telling you, you are going to be vulnerable if you do not know how to make money on your own because the layoffs are going to be heavy. Third, when the world sneezes, we get pneumonia as black people. So we're not going to get picked up as fast. So all the furloughs, we're going to get called back last. It sucks, but it's true. Go ask your grandparents when they got laid off. Or I even remember like in the steel mill, like how long it would take certain family members to get back in. And everyone's in the content game. I was just saying this earlier, like you're not just competing against your competition. You're competing against every, you compete against the Instagram girls, Gary V, Rock, Lewis Howes. Timbaland versus Swizz, D nice. It's only a certain amount of attention, attention that we can capture in a day from one person. So you have to learn to swarm the market. And it's part that sucks is people are lazy and get too comfortable and don't think they have to create that much. And by the time they do, it's too late. Like, how long have you been creating content? Shit. 
man, five years, six yeah, years. Yeah, you wish you would have started eight years ago, right? Oh, my God. I wish I would have been at IU. I wish I would have dropped out of school and done it. The world is going to change. So you're going to have to learn how to create. And I still hate being on camera, but I'm like, I can't want to be on Breakfast Club, Good Morning America, Good Day LA, and not do every piece of media that I can. And we can talk about the vulture thing here. So I understand your stance on, and I'm going to say this for everybody. Let's take Vlad. Let's take Gary. Who else? Let's say Lee Lior. Yeah. And I say this to Ty all the time. We can complain about the vultures, but the vultures put out more content than we do. They do. I love Button. Love, and I like Button in 2001 when, when, when Get Right With Me came out. So before it was even popular to like Button. Button with a three hour platform still does not put out more material than Vlad. It's and he doesn't, he, he could chop the shit up off the episode. Now, they do good with the cartoon. They made Rory pop, Maul pop. Vlad still has more content than Button. And Char Charlemagne just got a YouTube this year or late last year. I just, uh, I was <laughs> because you know, you got trademark and do all this stuff. I looked yeah. at the trademark for Donkey the other day, two years ago. It wasn't trademarked. I looked at it like a month ago. He finally, tra tra finally trademarked. trademarked it. So, what you're saying is absolutely true. Like, for those of you that don't know the context, so for me, like, Gary V, obviously, when it comes to his business mind, he has an astute business mind. When it when it comes to content, he's he's done an outstanding job of building yeah. himself from basically being a normal entrepreneur to now he's an influencer to now he's a part of pretty much all the cultures. But I feel like he's a flat out culture vulture. He uses black people for clicks and for views. And I don't know how much he's putting his money behind us and investing in us. But like Ian just said. Gary V is absolutely kicking my ass when it comes to content. content. That man's putting out 60, 70, 80, 100 yep. people a day. For, for, but even before he had a team, he did it for himself. So, so the thing I can say is, okay, is he and Lior more of a vulture or black CEOs of music companies that don't treat their artists right? I think they're in the exact same fold. I think it's- Okay, because nobody want to say that. Yeah. And like I look at black CEOs and, and those that just then I post a video with uh, Waka talking about that. Like they're the one they're they're We can understand them a little bit better because, yeah. like you said, they might have came from East Chicago, mm -hmm. they came from like Nap. And when you work your way up and you were the kid that got teased and you had to dodge the drug dealers, and then you got to college and you walked onto campus and you didn't know if you fit in and you finally graduated. Then you got that internship. You had to learn office politics and you yeah. finally got offered a job and then you rose to the top. And they're so scared mm -hmm. of going back to that. That they yeah. don't want to ruffle feathers to lose that six hundred thousand dollars a year a year salary. So yeah. I can understand their logic. They some whole yeah. ass niggas, but I can understand it. With yeah. Gary V and with Lior, y'all had options. So why y'all over here dancing with us? You okay, but I mean? but the truth is, okay, let's take Lior, right? But if Dame did business with a vulture, and you know he a vulture, don't that make you a vulture? And I love Dame. But don't that make you a vulture too? Because it, it like I, I can't say Dorian, man, you're a vulture and I take your checks. Yeah. I mean, we're but as black people, we're all vultures because we don't have no resources. So especially at that time okay. when it went to get the finance and went to get like where was Rockefeller gonna get the money? It was gonna have to be from a white dude that's probably a vulture or a racist. Like, because now true. I I made this comment. This is the first generation of ultra black wealthy. There's no such thing as black old money. That's right? true. And that's true. American old money. So yeah. the Carters, the Hearts, the Young, yeah. the yeah. Jameses, the Durants, if you yeah. have kids, like they are going to the Kardashians. And I'll just stop there. But like they yeah. are going to be second, third generation black money. So if you need VC funding from a black man, a black woman, a black family, there's going to be billionaire black families. Dame and Jay didn't have that option. Now, yeah. Like I like I like you just said, so I guess they are a vulture, but so are we. You know what I mean? If you look at it like that, like yeah. I worked for GCU before I became a full-time entrepreneur. Yeah. I don't like college, but I was they were paying me seventy thousand dollars a year and I was taking yeah, yeah, yeah. and pumping yeah. it into group eighty two. I was taking yeah. their money, you know what I mean? So I feel like when you're black, that's just the options that we have, which is bullshit, but which is why what you're doing is fucking like. God's plan. I mean, but it's it's the hardest with us because, like, and I tell everybody because growing up in the environment, I can say it. It's like people think investing a scam, but when it was time to go get work and get packs, 
there was like no second thought about that. And I'm like, I get it's comfortable and like, cause you can see it, but it's like, I shouldn't have to convince you that Apple is a good company. Like Apple been a good company since the mid nineties. Microsoft's been good since the, like most of us grew up on Microsoft. If you're 30 or yep. 35, like oh, nice. there's certain yeah, staples that are good that have been good for like, and lasted the test of time. So that's why I was like, and if we can get more of us, and I love the buy back the block movement, that picked up steam. Yes. Great. It's like, we got to, and I always tell people all the time, like, it's not real estate or investing. It's both. Because if you have a money machine, like if you look at Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett owns a bunch of stocks and a bunch of commercial properties and a bunch of residential properties and businesses. Like, it's not one or the other. It's usually both. You like, you have to put them all all together and, and be able to monetize it. So we got a lot of amateur investors in the audience. And I know that you can get really, really deep with it. Like you didn't or like an Einstein with this shit. But one 100%. thing I heard on your earn your leisure, man, that I didn't know. And it's and it's really rare, man, that I hear something. I'm like, man, I had no idea about that. So um was about the stock market and about slavery. So what I want you to do, please, is like break down the stock market, how you would talk to Xander about it. Well, how you've already talked to him. I know who you yeah. And then also, please tell people about how the historical aspect of it and what it has to do with us. Stock market was based on slavery. So, like, that's where the term you come from good stock comes from out of the South. So, like, the combine system, like, slaves were originally traded on Wall Street. They literally had a wall on Wall Street so you could not see the auctions happening. So that's why when everybody started to be like, man, the combine look like a slave. That's what the, they look like. You're trying to compare bodies and attributes and features to see who can help you with crops and produce and et cetera. And then of course, the insurance part comes in because if you have 500 slaves and let's say you lose 250 of them or 300, you want to hedge your bet and monetize if they die, because you can't lose half of your product so think of it if they're iphones Edge me. Huh? um you, you want to like mitigate the risk or loss you don't want to lose all your money there you go. Okay. so they're like insurance on it right so this isn't thing and this isn't like something i heard in a barbershop like i was told this by an older jewish guy so like so the origins of it is that and that's where life insurance came from like that came from the process of owners getting money from slaves that died wow because you were insuring your product so when you start to read it and then even like if you go guys google huffington post um the origins of the stock market is tied to slavery it's there it's like it's not right written by umar johnson it's like <laughs> white people reporting on this and you're like what the hell like why didn't we learn this but like there are little relics even at iu like it was a big thing of that mural being yeah. in the class and it's like why isn't this taken down? And I even say with the vulture thing, we have to stop being mad at people that are racist for operating as racist because it's a religion. Yes. Like we want people to treat us fairly. We have to know that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So that's where the origins of the stock market came from, was from actually from slavery. And then if you look in who financed slavery, I don't want to had that conversation, but go look who paid for the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria. Oh, that's a different conversation. And that ties into the religion aspect because religious entities paid for the first ships to go round up the slaves. But I don't want to go too deep because I want my back to go cut off. I ain't going to oh, lie. Y'all need to um, go do the research. I know I have, man. Mm -hmm. it, it when you and this is what I learned on my financial journey because my parents were lower class and then once they had me it was middle class we were middle class on debt which is like yeah. the worst thing that we could have been I didn't realize till we till we got older get older yep yeah and, and and so but I understood why they do it because they wanted me and my sister have a better life than they ever did yep. but um so once I started learning like on my financial journey like education journey first of all it's one of the most humbling things that you'll ever do when yes. you're 27 28 29 and you don't know what a fucking stock is or how the stock market works it's kind of embarrassing to yourself but you actually learn and then you grow but another thing too is like it allows me to understand it it gave me more black pride man you know what i mean because yeah. like i was like yo my ancestors survived and they had none of this knowledge they didn't know any of this all this yeah. stuff you just said like for me and you to be sitting right here talking on the internet 
yeah. through Facebook, which is owned by by Zuckerberg, through Google, through YouTube, is owned by Google, yeah. Periscope, funded by Jack Dorsey and their families. But we're going to use this to help build our brands. Our ancestors had to survive all of that and still oh, have yeah. checks and feed and get where, it's, where Dorian and Ian are having this conversation right now. So it's really deep and allow me to take pride in that. So I say all that for anybody that's listening, go do the research on what he just said, man, because it'll give you a sense of pride about who you are as a person and it'll give you the appetite to want to learn more, which I don't know if it did that for you. Was that a part of it once you really start learning about yeah, it? And once I learned that, it's like, look how much our ancestors had to sacrifice. And then also like from the perspective of like grandparents and what they had to do to make money. It's like, I really can't complain. It's hard for me to tell like my relatives that are older, man, I'm really working hard. They're like, what you do? I'm like, well, I sent some messages and I sat on my computer and I clicked some buttons and made some money. They're like, motherfucker, life easy for you. Like, do you know what I had to do to like make the kind of money you was making? I'm like, it gives it perspective. But if you go back even further, even my grandmother used to be like, segregation hurt our communities a whole lot because at least we had a sense of pride and wanted to help each other, even if we didn't like each other. She was like, we weren't rich, but we didn't do without. My grandmother grew up in rural Alabama. Yeah. In like midway Alabama. She's like, look, like, and even to this day, it's still like partially, they still have plantations there, which is crazy to see. So when I went to her funeral, it's like the slave master houses are still there. But she was like, when we were insulated, we as a community took care of each other. It's like it was still drama and people still hated it and, you know, people was messing around. But she's like, we took care of each other as a community. And once you know all of that, it's really hard to say, like, we can't work hard or because I'm like, who worked harder than slaves? Exactly. Like We put the work ethic into. So I'm like, I just took a blue collar approach to a white collar industry. And I'm like, let me put the two together and then just grind my way through. Yep. Yep. So let's so let's help each other now. Explain to the audience what is the stock market. A stock market, in, in the simplest way, is just um, an exchange where you can buy and sell companies. That's it. The, think of it that simple. I don't want you to get too complicated because the more complicated it gets, the more we step away from it. So right? anybody in the world who, or well, anybody in America who yeah. has money can buy a piece of Facebook or Apple or Nike or Microsoft. That's what you're telling the audience right now. Yes. And why should we do that? Because if you don't, you won't have enough for retirement. I tell every entrepreneur, if I can walk you into a meeting right now with Tim Cook and get you a grant for your business, would you take that meeting? Everybody always say yes. I might then tie your money and be like a baby angel investor and put your money into Apple. Because guess what? They have better processes, better product, more money for marketing than you do. So take your money. Think of it like you if you're a label. If you can put your money into Drake right now and get some of them streams or the Tootsie slide he just put out, <laughs> would you want to? Yes, that's the same damn thing as buying Apple. Then they'd be like, well, what about cannabis stocks? I'm like, that's like a local rapper that's getting 2,000 streams. He may be hot, but bro, he ain't streaming yet. He ain't popping yet. Exactly. Yeah, so it's the same thing. That that analogy is is perfect. Apple. So what Ian is saying for those y'all that don't really understand. So Tim Cook is the CEO of, of Apple. Yes. And he makes all the all the decisions. And if you agree with what Apple's doing, because you probably watch this on the Apple device, yeah. Yeah. you can go buy stock and you will become an ownership in Apple, which is essentially like becoming an ownership of Drake's music right now. Right. So if you can do that, you need to do that. What platforms are, are I'm trying to because I don't want you like shout out to me if you all know if you got affiliate deals or whatnot. No, I have no affiliate deals. I can't get any kickbacks. Okay. All right, cool. So if somebody wants to, if they got a hundred dollars, they know that shit about the stock market. What should they do today to start investing in and for the simplest way and the safest way for them that you feel? Um, download Robinhood. Start there. For my more seasoned investors, you can do TDM. And I, and I get this question all the time. Which one is best? All of them are good because the fees are damn near nothing now. So mm -hmm. TD Ameritrade, Vanguard, E-Trade, Schwab, Vanguard, Robinhood, M1, all of them are good. Pick one. If you know how to send a text, if you know how to DM on Instagram, for those of you who own Bumble, Tinder, don't tell me you can't use Robinhood. <laughs> it's easier. It's way, it's way easier. It's going to take you maybe 30 seconds to buy a stock. All you have to do is put in your social, connect your bank account, you type AAPL. Boom, 
set, done, buy, you're good. Easy, easy. You need a certain amount of money for Robin Hood? I would say start with 200, but you can, there are some companies you can buy, like AMD is under 100. You can buy AMD for less than 100 bucks. Yeah. But I'll tell everybody, investing has to be the first bill that you pay because we see it through this time. Call your cell phone company, whoever provides your gas and lights, and ask them, hey, man, I'm hurting. Uh, my kid is hungry. Can you guys refund me my money back and let me get 150 so I can buy groceries? I'm not going to do it. If you have money in the market, you can liquidate some of that in real time and take advantage of it and then be okay. But we get trained as African-Americans, I'm speaking to us, to buy shit first to show that we have worthiness. But when you pay bills first, all you are doing is giving your money to another family to make them rich. Exactly. I don't give a fuck how you spend it. Yep. And I, I have damn near no debt. Like the only debt I have is two hundred dollars to my name. And I used to be broke, 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 broke. And they fucked me up with them credit cards at IU and the union too. Man, that five hundred dollar credit card I think cost me thirty six hundred to pay off. Right. I'm telling you, if you do not pay yourself first, you're doing nothing but taking your money and giving it to another family. That's all you're doing because every company is owned by some family. It's all you're doing. So imagine if you work for a castle and all the money that came into your castle, you gave it to another castle. That shit sounds stupid, but we got trained to do that with bills. So you're saying to pay yourself first that everybody, as soon as they get their paycheck, they shouldn't look at the rent. They should look at the phone bill. They should look at the food. They should go to their Robinhood account, look at a company that they want to buy, and they need to buy stock as soon as they get their paycheck. Your car note finance company, your car company, who you get your oil changes with, Kroger, H-E-B here in Houston, don't give a fuck about you. Exactly. Be real with you. They don't. So you can do whatever you want to. I'll tell you what helped me to sleep well and what allowed me to curse in my interviews. Me paying myself first and then putting the money into the market. Because this is about freedom. That's what it really comes down to. 90% um, of investors lose money if they buy bullshit-ass companies. Everybody who got rich don't believe me. You don't got to believe shit I say. Go look at the Forbes 400. Pick any person you like. They got rich from either taking their company, company public or they were tied to financial services. Yes. Yes. Everything Ian's saying, man, like all this stuff I already know and I'm been, I've been practicing, but I want y'all to really under understand because we got we got somebody, Matrix Leaders, want to comment. Remember, over 90% of investors lose money. Ian just said that's that's going to happen, but you have to take risk, right? If if you buy bullshit, so if you buy GE4, cannabis stocks, certain uh, crypto, so I was telling y'all in real time, crypto is going to fall apart at 17,000. Everybody laughed at me. Y'all ain't laughing no more. Bro, why do you be slattering Ford so bad, man? Ford's a trash. <laughs> okay, okay. And now, now, let me ask you. You've been in L.A. You've been around some real ball players. You've been around some real hoopers. You've been around some real artists. Anybody with any money ever mention Ford to you? Hell no. Ever. No. And, and like and that's what it comes to investing. That's what you need to be doing. Like people make this stuff complicated. Like I'm seeing a lot of people writing comments right, right now, like they invest into the Robin Hood account. They don't know what to buy. Literally, go look at what you're using. Go, go <laughs> look at your toothpaste right now. Who makes your toothpaste? Keep it simple. Apple. Buy that. My, okay, so this is like hooping. So if we go to the park, or let's say you're a GM, and let's say next year you the GM of the Houston Rockets. And you got LeBron and KD on the board. Are you keeping Harden or are you getting LeBron and KD? LeBron and KD. That's Apple and Microsoft. But here's the thing. A lot of us like to talk to sound smart opposed to making money. Yes. Because it's a value thing. That's why you notice a lot of people in other races, they're quiet. And they turn around and get all the fucking money by being quiet. A lot of quiet, a lot of the vultures, quiet. They're quietly executing over and over and over again while we're debating. That's why I hate the rap debate thing. You notice like we are the only people in genre of music who debates who's the best. Exactly. It's fucking ignorant, man. It's so stupid. It doesn't matter if Tupac or Biggie or is best or Drake versus like, what difference do I make? Who's better, Braun, or what Braun doesn't do? I'm like, bro, Braun is paid. And you ask anybody who can play ball, that motherfucker's like Einstein, yes. whether you like him or not. And yes. even how he 
people like he team hops. He learned that shit from Buffett. Yeah. Buffett primary thing is if something is not performing well over a three year period, I have to let it go. So Brian, when everything stopped working in Cleveland, okay, let me jump ship, go to Miami. D Wade isn't him best self. Let me go back with Kyrie. Everything don't work in Cleveland because Jr. was high and didn't do what he was supposed to do and ran back towards half court. Let me go to L.A. Yeah, just invest in one on one. Cut your losers off and go with a winner. Now, I'm not saying you should do that with your friends, but in business, you got to cut shit off that ain't working. You can't do it like all the boom bap rappers, with the exception of probably Griselda. The boom bap shit don't work from the '90s. No, like you can't do it. You have to. Go with what's working. So what to invest in? Start Apple. My, go look at Apple where it was five years ago and tell me if you wish you invested in it. Apple 10 years ago, even with this drop, is up 1,000% over a 10-year period. 1,000. So that's penny stock-like returns with a legitimate-ass company. That's crazy. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. So let's let's take it up a notch. So let's say somebody's been investing in Robinhood for three or four years now. They've bought companies, they've sold, they got probably two thousand dollars in there, but they have a pretty solid portfolio for them, right? Mm -hmm. What else should they be looking at besides buying individual securities on Robinhood? What other investment vehicles should they be looking at? They got to buy index fund. So index fund is like an all-star team, and then you need to start to pour more money into it. Um, fellas, I can't speak to the women because I don't understand the plight of a woman. Fellas, you all have spent five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred. Some of y'all some tricks and spent three, four thousand on women. Put that shit into the market. Like them dates and vacations, that shit is cool until she leave. We all didn't mess with girls who we thought we was gonna kick it with forever, and the shit went away. Bro, put that money into the market. Trust me, like it's a way better investment. How do way you how do you buy an index fund? You can go to Robinhood and do it. One is VOO. Like Victor Olive Olive, that's the S&P 500, and it's through Vanguard. I like Vanguard because they have the lowest amount of fees. So I, now if you have a mutual fund, it's better than doing nothing. But if you have a mutual fund that you're paying 3% fees on, it doesn't seem like a lot. Year one, year 10, you gave up 30% of your money for what? For nothing. Let me, let me, I'll ask this 100 times already. During this era, for those of you that work, how many of you got a phone call or email from your 401k advisor telling you to do anything different during this crash? Nothing. Okay. I'm going to keep it real. A lot of y'all heard more from me on Instagram and Facebook than you did your own 401k advisor. Yeah, they don't give a damn. They don't give At a all. damn. Can you, At all. Can you explain the difference between an index fund and a, and a mutual fund? An index fund has lower fees. Okay. Th that's the only difference. They're both tied to, to the overall market, but a mutual fund you're going to pay a fee on. The expenses on um, an index fund, like through Vanguard, is 0.2%, 0.3%, opposed to paying like 3%, 4%, 5%. That it adds up. And you can do it yourself. So, one of the things that I've been pushing is we have to learn how to do this for yourself because no one cares about your money like you. And, and you know this from being an entrepreneur. And people always ask, well, why don't you outsource? So, why don't I'm like, people don't work as hard as you in your business. People aren't going to care as much. It's the number one issue that all entrepreneurs have is like, can I find someone else who's going? We even see in a hoop. Some of the guys are making nine million dollars a year, and you can't even get them to practice on time. Like, so in a business, people are not going to take it serious, and people are not going to care about your money as much as you do. You can do it, and some of you know me who went to. You remember that, and that's why I put the other day like. These messages hit different because some of y'all knew me from when I was really broke. Yeah. Standing touchdown terrace. Like <laughs> different eating rice aroni. You know what I mean? And I've done it all. Like I have Versace going back to the crib, eating rice aroni and top ramen. I ain't heard touchdown terrace since we was in school. In school. It's like, yo, this is real. Like, come on. Exactly. Like, so, yeah. so so we got Robin Hood individual securities. We have a VOO Vanguard. That's a that's an index fund. That's oh, yeah. SP five hundred. Is there anything else that you feel like everybody should have as an investment vehicle? I mean, if we want to be honest, you need more than one. Yes. Um. So I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you need a business, and you need that business to be cash flow positive with no debt. I know everybody wanted to kill me a year ago about this no debt thing I've been on. 
What how do you, you feel? You mean that they want to kill you? What elaborate? Because people are black with debt is good if you know what to do with it. And that I'm like, fucking sucks. Who said that? I, stupid people. It's like okay, but if you've been broken, you've been in the hood before. Owen is never good, but when you can't pay it back, <sighs> so you to invest in the market long term yeah. first. Um, real estate. Go ahead. That's, royalties so yeah, yeah yeah that's that's crazy man because like because like i told you like my parents they they had debt and so because of that i have a very negative relationship with debt i do too group 82 will never have debt yep. even when i'll be looking at like venture debt deals like i would never take that do it. so i said and i'm gonna put it in my estate and in my will like once i leave like i don't want us to ever have debt on this company mm -hmm. like y'all gonna start some other shit not anything that i'm attached to because yeah. like you just said People think like if you buy a house, you put in money into the house, which is good, but this is your primary residence. This yeah. is where you live. You know what I mean? So if you ever need to liquidate this house, you have nowhere to live. And so no people right. borrow yeah. against their house. Or they feel like you can use the credit card and do this. Bro, you got to pay the money back. No one's giving yeah. you the money for free. You got to pay it back. Got to pay it back, man. You have to. And then it's like you're not smarter than Visa and MasterCard who figured like because they're banking on you having an emergency or getting laid off so they can tax the fees on top of it. Exactly. Like the banks make all their money off of late fees and then credit card debt. So, but honestly, if we're going to have an honest conversation, like every entrepreneur probably needs, I know people love to say seven. That's not the real number. Like people that I talk to with money, they didn't have like a hundred, 300 streams of income. Yeah. It's yeah. like seven is a good starting point, but you need to get to a baseline of like 10. Yes minimum like but the conversations that i had in the black community i'm sure you experience this too when i go to other rooms and there's not many of us conversations are different about how much is needed and then when i told a few people like yo you need 60 months of savings it shocked me too when i heard it but i was in a meeting with a guy who showed me 15 million in his account he was like bro if you don't have 60 months of shelter that's what he called it shelter that's a good one i like that better you're vulnerable yes and i'm like and when, when I went through the flood, I was like, okay, I'm good. But what if I had to replace everything? Because so those of you like, yo, we got insurance. Insurance company is not always going to pay out on time. Yeah. They're not going to give you the full value. So what if I had to replace everything? Bam. Okay. That's when I started to think different. And I'm like, let me save the majority of the money in the company. And then looking at like what Marshawn Lynch, Lynch did, what uh, Gronk did, the other sources of income they put away. And just stacked it up and lived off one or two sources and, and they were good and it takes sacrifices because there's some days i see some some shit online i'm like man i can get the car shit from new york get a bentley and hell yeah but you have to sacrifice so you can have freedom and we're so. going through it right now a lot of people with this coronavirus like if you got furloughed or your job closed up shop like how you gonna pay your rent next month if they don't open things up this yeah. is why you need to be investing this is why you need to be saving money this is why you need to have multiple streams of income you yep. can't have all your eggs in one basket because when you do that they will always own you always yep. we're gonna we're gonna take some questions here david gibson asks with the recent drop in the market due to uncertainty what companies or industries do you anticipate rising in stock value tech like I literally have a have a stock club. People pay me for advice. Two of the ones I just gave you, Apple, Microsoft went up six percent today. Apple and Microsoft for the companies that dropped the least in this recession. Because here's the truth: if technology, as the industry goes away, we will be living in like the equivalent of Walking Dead. We're talking through a communication platform, which is technology. Even Ford, when Ford was like a great company back in the day. The assembly line was a technological advance that gave them an advantage. So tech first is going to be good. So uh, AMD is a good one. Amazon, pricey, but good. Microsoft, Visa. Uh, Visa is debt and tech combined. Start there. Start there and you'll be good. You'll see some of your greatest gains in technology. Matrix Lee asks, should you still have a 401k through your job? Yes, but the thing I tell about everyone with their 401k, you have to know what's in it. Most people have no clue what's in it. You How have you to manage your money. L log into the portal to see what's in your 401k, print it out, and start to look at what funds they have you in. And then ask them why. One great question if you talk to your advisor. Most people don't. Ask them, what are you in? 
Yes. And see if what they're in matches the shit that you're in. And ask why. What's the can you explain to people? Because everybody feel like that's the main thing for the retirement is a 401k. Can you explain the benefits of a corporation offering a 401k to their employees? Why they do that? Um, it's great because like they know the real answer is they know that most people won't do it on their own. But the company gets a kickback from certain companies to put all of their employees into a 401k system. That's why you normally don't hear from your advisor because they already got the money up front. Anyway, so but if your company matches, get the match. That's great. But you still have to invest something on your own. We get too trapped up into should we do 401k, Roth RA, how much we should contribute, which platform versus how many shares we need. You need a certain amount of shares to be able to be free. Like you're really not, in, and it hurt my feelings when I heard this, but you're really not into the game of investing until you had 10,000 shares. Yeah, which is which is a lot. A lot. So it's like, that's why starting early is so important. And I tell parents all the time, like kids will listen to you about investing if they see you do it. Xander listens to me about it because he sees me in front of them fucking monitors all the time. Yeah. The kids watch what we do, not what we say. Yep. So that's why a lot of times they'll be like, well, I don't want to do this because you don't do it. But if they see you doing it and they see money comes from it, they don't follow. Because kid, like, and I know as a kid, people are like, oh, you need to go to school and you need to do this. And it's like, but you went to school and you are happy and you aren't where you want to be. Kids can feel that if you're happy in what you do. Like, there's other things you could be doing right now. You have to love what you do in order to be able to like create content at 7 30 at night. You can be taking a nap. Like you can be spending time with your kids. So it's like kids are going to follow what we say. So 401k, yes, get the match, but you have to learn how to do it on your own. Because as much as we flex as a race, we're going to be one of the brokest fucking generations in history. It's, I, I say that all the time. People get on me when I say that shit, but you know I don't give a fuck. Like Black people collectively, we're just so behind because a lot of stuff that you're saying, and we yeah. we remain broke. Like we finance everybody else. You know what I mean? Like when the things was going on with like the NFL, and yeah. before Jay Z came back into the fold, like I kept telling people like, "Yo, why aren't you watching?" I'm like, "Because when you watch, like you're financing the." people who think this way like you're yes. putting money into their pockets like it wasn't until they put jay-z into that room where it convinced me like okay i'm gonna give them a chance but then everybody went and slandered him i'm like what what do y'all fucking want like y'all will watch the white dudes who are being racist and support them but the moment that they bring a black dude in there now you call him a fucking sellout like what is wrong yeah. with you yeah it happens i mean but that's and that's just a discipline issue like all of all of our movements have been cut short by lack of discipline even like the infiltration like i don't want to go get too deep into it but it's like we won't stand for any principles long enough nope like like even i love the block back buy back to block movement but not enough of us are doing it because in our community if one guy and i've been through this like trying to partner with people that are black it always comes down to who's going to be the face and the head of it not how we're going to get the money yeah like, yeah. and I'm active, like the majority of people that I do business with are not of our hue. A lot of them don't like each other, but they're, they're still getting money together. Like some of them hate each other and they are running that fucking bag up while hating each other. And that's something that, that we got to realize too. Like business isn't personal and everybody heard it before, but it's just like, you really, really need to view it that way. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you can make money with somebody especially if, if it's from the same culture. Like y'all might have two completely different views. Like it's I don't see with a lot of Kanye's views, or I don't agree with like a lot of people, or even Candace Owens. But if it was the right business opportunity that didn't violate my morals or my integrity, like I would yep. absolutely do that with them, man. Because they black. Man, look, Steve Jobs hated Bill Gates, but took Bill Gates' money when he came back in Apple. Apple and Microsoft still do business together to this day, and they're fucking rivals. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We got a question for Rocky Miller. How do you feel about investing in banking stock? Um, if you're gonna hold it for a ten year period. I don't mind it. I don't, I'm not a fan of banks. Um, but if you do Goldman, maybe JP Morgan, not bad. Banks have a limited upside though. They have a very limited upside. Why is that? Just because they can't run and give you the same gains that technology stocks or pharma companies could. Um, cause they're more susceptible. Like if Lord forbid there's any run on the bank, but if you majority of any banking sector, 95% of the banks are 
people that don't have a lot of money in them. So anytime that we hit a financial crisis, people are going to start to take the money out and the loans aren't going to flow through as freely. And then on top of that, like all the deception that goes on in the, I call it the back end market, if you will, with like derivatives and synthetic products, that shit's still going on. It's just 2008 kind of hit like the exotic products that got us in trouble in 2007 and eight are still there. They're just called different things. And then we got the big ass student loan crisis, which when that bubble pops, maybe in 10 or 15 years, that's going to be a crisis because it's like crazy. Nobody can pay their loans now. None. That's going to be fucking insane when that happens. Yep. On top of credit card debt, it's like, you know, debt is slavery. Like, regardless of what you think of religion, a couple of them parables about debt, they they are spot on. Like, you do not want to be enslaved to anybody. Absolutely. We're going to take a few more questions, then we'll get out of here. Clavin Thompson asks, why is cannabis not good for investment? Um, I would encourage you to go pull up C-A-N-N and look at a five-year chart. You're going to see the chart go down like this. So imagine if you average 32 points your freshman year, and every year after that, you average 11 points. <laughs> you, you're you not going to go number one. You're not going to be in the first round. So you're not even going to get drafted. <laughs> it, it's tough. I'm not done, baby. Damn. It's crazy. Matrix Lee asks, what was your biggest one day loss and biggest one day gain? He asked me. Um, biggest one day gain, I don't want to say, but it's enough to put a smile on my face. My biggest one day loss is twenty nine thousand dollars. Oh wow, oh wow! And because you had a safety net, you had the cushion, you had oh. everything, and you understand this is business. How did that make you feel emotionally or like mentally? I was pissed. I'm like I'm, I'm losing the amount of money that some of my relatives made in a year. Hold on, baby. Give me one second. I need you to leave out, baby. Is it that important? Okay. Yes, Give me a second. Um, it pissed me off. But but here's the truth. So when you lose money in business, it's always your fault. Yes. I took a trade that I shouldn't have taken at a time I shouldn't have taken it. That was not my setup. Now, of course, I was pissed. I, boy, I, I literally did the, the boys in the hood trade cry on accident, like swing in the air shit. Like, because I'm looking at the loss and I'm like... <laughs> Like, bro, I, like 27, like, shit, like, but I learned from it. And for all of my students, like, and people in my program who know how to trade, that's why I'm like, wait, wait. So this month, like in the middle of this crisis, I'm 17 to 17, haven't lost a trade. God forbid, knock on, knock on wood, right? But it takes those errors to know, don't do this shit again. Same thing with LeBron. After Brian lost in Dallas. He trained different. Yeah. Like he played different. He picked different. Now it's a lot that he can do better, even in this season, but he gradually worked on his game. And then I'm like, okay, I'm never going to lose that amount of money again. I'm not going to trade it this time. I'm going to do this. and Because I'm like looking and it triggers you because you're going back to your childhood of like, am I self sabotaging? Because mm -hmm. when you come from an environment, you almost think and you get tricked into being like money's bad. Yeah. Money's not bad. Trust me, it doesn't make you whole. It doesn't give you a purpose, but it will give you a cushion. And like, trust me, especially when you have a family, like you need that. But it was tough to lose that kind of money one day and then have to work your way out of it. Yeah. You know, and then when you do, it's like, okay, great. I appreciate those lessons. So and I've, I've had some good days too, but I've uh, never had lost that big. Again. I just imagine you just like in, <laughs> like in Bro, the like the tears came out the corner of my eye and went under my neck. Damn, man. And I didn't even know I was crying. I was like, I can't what hold on. That that can't be real. And the tears is coming. I'm black. I'm like, yo, like I remember in college not having seven, eight hundred dollars in my bank account. And like see, I gotta pay rent. I don't know where it's gonna come from. And I gotta go to Kroger and get food or yeah. You know, see if I can slide somewhere and go in the union and get some pizza. I remember like kicking it with bigs, like, yo, man, I got a hundred. We can split this up. You get 50, I get 50. Let's see if we can make something happen on some food. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. 
And this, this, I think this question is going to take us right into Red Panda Academy. You may have covered this before I tuned in. However, what books and resources would you suggest to study and gain more understanding about evaluating stocks? I want you to really talk about your platform, Red Panda Academy, and how it can help people and what you got going on with that right now. Um, so Red Panda Academy is the platform that I have to teach people how to invest in the market the right way from the very beginning. Um, and I always tell people this. When people talk about investing and trading, you should ask a couple questions. Do you invest for a living? Because if you stay at your auntie house, I want to hear your advice about investing. Two, can I see you invest in real time? And then how much are you making? To answer the question about books and resources that we need, I'm, I'm talking to us specifically that are black. I'm going to give you the book that is life changing. Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. I've been saying this for four years. I have no affiliation with Tony or anybody in the book. If you buy the book and don't like it and you read it all the way through, I'll buy the book off of you. That book has made me more money than any other book I've ever read. I say, four, say it again and can somebody type that in the comments after Ian says it? Money mastered the game. Now, Tony didn't write the book. It's not his investment philosophy. He interviewed the top. Yes. Money. Baby. You're fine. Just going to the living room. I'll do it later. Um, Ray Dalio, Cal Bass, Paul Tudor Jones, like these are multi-billionaires that he interviewed and he took them and put them. So think of him as like being Elliot Wilson interviewing the top rappers about how to get into the game and how to be popular. Yeah. Um, but as African-Americans, we have to stop reading and start doing. Because we confuse the reading part and research with the action. And it's not totally different. It's not like I told you what to invest in. And I'm not talking to the brother who asked the question, mm -hmm. but we don't need more research. Sometimes you just have to like, okay, take it like this. When we start hooping, we didn't go read a book by Mike in no. or Nate Smith no. about how to hoop. We got on the court. We just start throwing the ball at the rim. Then it's like, okay, if I put the ball in the middle of the backboard, I'll get something to go in. Investing is kind of the same thing. Like you have to start. If you just start with Apple and Microsoft, you'll be good. But some of people are going to wait five, six, seven, eight, nine years and I get started and it's going to be a horrible, a horrible thing. But but that, that's a great book. So with Red Panda Academy, do you teach people how to do? Yeah. OK. Yeah, no theory. So like the futures market, which is the most competitive asset class there is to invest in. I covered that a lot. Um, how to invest in real time, because that it's a sport the thing that makes futures hard is day one there is no bitty ball in futures day one you're competing against the best what is, what is futures for the audience futures is like to give a simple answer like you're estimating what the market is going to do because it's open 23 hours a day so if you turn on C cnbc before the market opens they're going to say the futures market is up or down that sets the tone for what the overall stock market is going to do so I know more people know about the rapid future than the futures market, mm -hmm. but just Google CNBC futures. No, baby. And then you'll be able to see some information on the futures market. And that's where the S&P 500. And if you guys like see me post my wins and losses, that's what I'm trading. So long term investing first and then you'll trade the futures market. Don't grab that. Don't grab that. So with anybody who wants to do the Red Panda Academy, they don't need to have any sort of financial knowledge. They don't need to have they don't need to have any of that. Like you take people from the very beginning and you equip them with the tools to start understanding how to invest. I prefer you not to know anything, but you must have work ethic because okay. if you know stuff already, I'm going to have to break habits that you have that probably are not good. But you have to have work ethic like I notice with our people. We're almost skeptical because we think everything is too good to be true because we've been convinced our whole li our whole our whole lives yeah. that we're not worthy to make money and that it's too hard. Like, and that's why I always try and do analogies. I'm like, okay, even if for, for the ladies, Apple and Microsoft are Beyonce and Rihanna. Imagine if you can be the label that had both. Okay, that's it. Now you don't need Meg the Stallion if you got Rihanna and Beyonce. No shouts to Meg, no, no slight to her, but Thing, put up the numbers like same thing Drake and if you could have Drake and Kendrick Kendrick it's like who else do you need yeah Cole maybe but yeah yeah it's like you're gonna do numbers get them to game set match you're good you're yeah good. so yeah.
But yeah, Money Master of the Game is a great book and read it. Like to Ray Dalio, of course, who started mentoring Puff recently. He his strategies in there. Kyle Bass, multi-billionaire, his strategies in there. Par Tudor Jones, which is like the Michael Jordan of like futures trading. His book is in there. Paul Jones's net worth is like 5.1 billion. Shit. Like these ain't no people with a little bit. These are like the people we look up to. These are the people they look up to. They're in that book. So read the book, apply the strategy. And even like my strategy for saving 80% of the money in the company and being debt free came from that book. It works wonders if you apply it, but don't just skim through the shit and be like, oh, I ain't like it. Yeah, like yeah. apply it and see if it actually works, then report back to me. Yeah, yeah. How you like it? So cool, man. So Red Panda Academy. What's your website? Uh, join RedPanda.com. Um, if you guys go there, put in your name and email, you get some free tips. Once uh, every Monday, our room is open, so you can see it's like trade and talking best in real time. And then if you follow me on Instagram at the Master Investor, like I put out, I think last week I may have put out like forty gems and on twitter i put out maybe like 350 like pieces of advice for free we so, got a lot of people still got questions where can they hit you up so instagram is that the best way if they got any questions instagram is the best place where you can email me in at join red panda and those of you who want to IU with me you know you can hit me on facebook or text yeah. me like i'm the same ian so don't be like i'm brand new because i got on you know a suit and i got some exposure i'm the same person same person so Man, man, we could we could go for two hours, man. But I know you gotta go. You got stuff to do, man. But this was this was amazing, brother, man. And I and I want to give you your props too, man. What you're doing is you're elevating us. You're elevating people. You've been so open with your knowledge. Um, even when I asked you to do this, you were on it. Like, man, I really really appreciate what you're doing. And I know how hard it is being an entrepreneur, creating content, and you just, and you just putting this stuff out there, man. Please continue because you are literally changing people's lives, and this is just the beginning for you one thing i want to I want to tell the audience is that ian's trying to get on the breakfast club and and i know that they're y'all watch the breakfast club and y'all know how to talk so there's there's two versions of the of the breakfast club you got like the main main version and you got like one where they talk about business and like stuff yeah. like that. and i said so i don't know which one ian's trying to get on but he for a fact it's more than qualified to be on that business breakfast club so if y'all know anybody over there at power or y'all know anybody that can connect him with that or y'all want to start a campaign Please do that because Ian's one of us. He belongs to us and we need to elevate this man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, before we hop off, you know, I got to pick your brain. How much content should entrepreneurs be putting out in this market to break through? So with me, and it's about being realistic about what you, what you can do. So mm -hmm. there's three E's when it comes to social media. You either have to be educating, mm -hmm. entertaining, or erotica. One of your, one okay. of your your social media account has to be doing one of those, right? Gotcha. Like, let's say that you are a suntan lotion company, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to take the education route, you need to be talking about like the, the UV rays and what you use to make the product and make videos talking about for all the education nerds who care about that, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to take the entertainment route, maybe you make videos where people are getting slapped in the face with your, with your suntan lotion so mm -hmm. it brings awareness to that about it if you want to take the erotica route you need to be making videos where you got attractive women or attractive men rubbing suntan lotion all of them all three of them are going to get you value when you do that you'll start learning what your social media strategy should should be yeah. and you'll be able to see what your audience is going to give you now because of that i would say you need to be posting between ig stories instagram twitter facebook youtube wherever may your audience is at least 10 a day on all those platforms if you can all by yourself and like 10 a day i mean like you can do it. polls four ig stories some tweets a youtube video etc yeah. and that's why having a team is so important like me i got a whole bunch of interns yeah. and they help me tenfold so but if you can do 10 a day man that's realistic as your team expands which i know yours will yeah we need to be and this and gary v said this and y'all know how i feel about it but he was right Bro, I want to get to the point where I'm posting like 5,000 pieces of content a day. <laughs> Easily. That's the, uh, like, if you look at anybody that's popping, even from like a media standpoint, they're doing that. Like, even with Russ, like Russ could be bigger, but like to everything he's doing on his own, it helped for how much content he put out. And then if you look at 07 Wayne, Future back in the day, Tupac, like those are all content plays. They were just putting out Master P back in the day. Bro, they was putting out more content. Yeah, Jay-Z putting out more content 
than everybody. So yeah, I, I'm glad you said the ten. But yeah, a goal is to get like four or five thousand out. Pay attention, like I mean, Nike. Like think about the relationship you and I have with Nike. Yeah. And with us since we were babies. That's we true. Swoosh all day. That's yeah. content. You know yeah. what I mean? Think about how much they've invested into that. You know what I mean? That's, so, point, yeah. that's who we're competing against. And like these brands, Nike, McDonald's, Starbucks, Chipotle, yeah. everywhere. So yeah. Ian ain't talking about Red Panda. Dorian ain't talking about Group 82. Ain't nobody else talking about it. That's real. Run ads and put as much as that stuff out there and it's nonstop. So yeah. I appreciate it, man. I love what you're doing. Um, we got to get up whenever this crazy Corona stuff passes. But yeah, I'm proud of you, man, because I told you before we start getting on, the amount of content you put out is, and you're consistent. Like, regardless if you happy, sad, tired, I'm like, man, like even your intro, my ducks, my sw I'm like, <laughs> you got your you got your content down, man. So I'm proud of you. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate that. So hope y'all enjoyed this.